Good morning. Good morning. Let's, uh, let us rise and greet the day. challenged on the mentality of, of church planting and one of the multiplication conferences we went to it really talked about tithing your people so when you reach a certain size and that's going to vary for each congregation right so you you tithe 10 percent of your people and it's the first fruit right it's the so the best the, the leaders, the people who are in leadership, you take those that 10% and you go and you start a new church with those that 10% of the people, and then you're raising up. So it's a continual cycle of raising up leaders to send off, to raise up more, to send off. And that's just kind of a different mentality because um, you know, I guess maybe I'm a little selfish and I want to keep you all. I, I don't want to send you off. I, I want to keep you. And yet, we know that there are needs, and we know that there are many kinds of people, and it's going to take many kinds of churches to bring people into the fold. And so, you know, there's no magic size of a church. Um, 
thank goodness. And there's no uh, magic formula to make it work. Uh, but it's just, it's interesting. I'm excited for this conference. Um, I'm excited to, to hear the speakers and to join with people from all around the world, 17 time zones. Um, we have folks, our, our, so many friends are in Africa. They're joining us. I'm, I'm just so excited um, to, to be a part of this conference. And if you would like to, to be a part of it, even if you can't do every day, if you want to do one day, talk to Roy and see if there's a time that would work for you to join this on this conference, okay? The cost is currently $40, so that promo code um, will make it $20 for you. Northwest Early Meeting, NWYM2020 is the promo code. So, um, so get registered. Register. Let us know if you need help doing that. We do have some praises and some prayer requests. We have um, some folks not feeling 100% uh, today. We will con um, continue to pray for just everyone as they battle germs. Um, you know, it's it is a little sad anymore that if we cough or sneeze or uh, don't feel well, that our initial reaction is, <gasps> is it COVID? Like it, it really is. Like we're, we're, and so many of us are battling just not feeling well, and it's not, it doesn't have to be COVID related. Um, so we do want to pray for um, Paul Chekets, he's just not feeling well this morning. They plan on being here. Uh, Karen did uh, text me this morning to let me know that they were going to stay home and rest and recuperate. So grateful for them. Um, uh, Paco is just feeling under the weather, uh, and so we'll pray for healing on him. Many, many families um, from Greenleaf are not feeling well. Some of it is COVID-related. So we will continue to pray for just all of our teachers and our students and their families. Um, we will um, continue to pray for Eva, Pat's daughter. We, we are thankful, we are giving praise to Jesus that she is safe, that she is out of the elements, she um, is in a home, that um, she's getting help to know how to proceed. Pray for her as she um, gets some financial help in um, from the government, and we're just going to continue to pray that God keeps his hand on her life. Um, we'll continue to pray for our sweet baby James. Um, this is Betty's great-grandson. He um, visits a specialist on Wednesday for his ears, probably put tubes in, and, and there's just some other things going on um, with this sweet baby that we'll just pray for him, um, and for his parents, and his family. Uh, Val did pop, Val is watching, joining us online this morning, and she wanted to make sure we knew that Linda is out of the hospital, and Linda thanks us for praying for her. So um, we are giving praise to Jesus for bringing healing to Linda's body as well. Are there other prayer requests or praises that I have neglected to mention this morning? I'm sure there are. Um, if those come to my mind or to yours, we'll get those in open worship. Um, for our online family, just make sure you put those in the comments and we will be sure to share your prayer requests or praises with the congregation during open worship as well. Join me in prayer. Thank you, Jesus, that we can join together. Um, though it's cold and snowy outside here in the Treasure Valley. I thank you that um, we have a warm facility to meet in, a, a beautiful warm facility. I thank you that our, our families have homes with heat. Um, and Lord, I just pray that you be with all of us as we um, go into what is normally flu and cold season, and it still is flu and cold season. 
And now we've added um, this virus to the mix. Lord, and I just pray that you uh, keep a hedge of protection around us. Lord, as we um, battle germs, I pray that our symptoms are minimal. We pray for um, the vulnerable, um, that they're not, their immune systems aren't compromised by our germs that we bring to everywhere we go. Um, Lord, we just do want to continue to pray for our nation, for a time of healing, um, a healing among the people. Lord, I just pray that um, as, as your followers, as your believers, that we can join together at the foot of the cross where we are all equal, that we can claim you, Jesus, that the blood that you shed was for all of our sins, Jesus. And I just pray that um, we continue to sow seeds of kindness and patience and love and gentleness. Jesus, I just pray that as, as we worship this morning, that our hearts are those of rejoicing and giving praise to you, for you are good all the time.
I won't quite say gullible, but maybe a little bit, just like, I don't know. I, I haven't had a good uh, image with the word meek. Certainly not a war stallion. More of a, maybe a little mouse. I'm just, that's not in my notes. That's just completely honest. They could still be my notes, to be honest. <laughs> okay, so that strength that is under control, it's strength that knows when to assert itself and when to be passive, as opposed to reacting purely out of emotion. It's strength that can effectively defend itself and what it values, all the while knowing that it, in itself, is not in control, but is instead a capable and crucial instrument of the one who is. So now I want you, when you hear the word meek, I want you to picture a war horse trained to be disciplined, retain their fierce spirit and courage and power, but they're an instrument under the control of someone else. So where do we go with that with us? We're to be meek. We are to retain our values, our courage, our strength. But we're an instrument under the control of another, and that is Jesus. Amen. We have a new baby in our church family. Um, so seeing that Nala is just over a year old, I remember well how gentle we were with her. I mean, she was itty bitty tiny. And I have no doubt that the Ericsons handle baby Eric very gently. They, they pick him up carefully. They support his head. They don't pick him up by his arms and swing him around. They, they treat him as precious and fragile. You know, when you pass off the baby, depending on who you're passing the baby to, you know, you got their head, you support them, and you got them, in, and you make sure that they have that baby before you let go. You make sure. You don't trust that the baby can't hold on to you. You, you have to make sure you're holding the baby. Um, so I, I understand a little more the, the meaning of gentleness. Um, Nala has known the word gentle for a long time. She's, um, she can be a bit aggressive with her lovings, as Omari has fully experienced her aggressive lovings. Um, but if we say, be, be gentle, she will touch the person's cheek. And that is often her form of giving a love over a kiss or a hug. Um, we'll say, Sometimes she'll say, no, she doesn't want to give me a kiss, and she doesn't want to hug, and I'll say, can I have a gentle? And she'll reach up, and she'll, she'll touch my cheek, usually gently. Sometimes even that's a little uh, aggressive, where we say, gentle, gentle with the gentle. But she, and I don't know where she learned this. She's just, um, probably her parents, but for a long time, she's known the gentle, and that's a form of, of love for her. Um, and it, it's not aggressive, it's, it's one that's um, soft-handed. In Galatians 6.1, it says, If someone is caught in a sin, you who are spiritual should restore him gently. The King James says, Restore such a one in a spirit of meekness. I think Paul is saying, be very, very gentle with them. Don't have a better than thou attitude. Be humble. Be gentle. The Bible says that Moses was a meek or humble man. In fact, in Numbers 12, 3, it says, Now Moses was a very humble man more humble than anyone else on the face of the earth, or as it reads in the King James. Now the man Moses was very meek above all the men who were upon the face of the earth. Let's 
talk for a minute about people in a position of power. Each one of us has been given some power. And it's interesting to watch how different people handle the power in their life. Um, it, it's very difficult to handle correctly or with humility or simplicity. It's very difficult not to abuse power. And we hear that those terms together often. They're abusing their power. I'm afraid they're going to abuse their power. I think that although failure is difficult to handle, success is even more difficult. See, with failure, we're usually beaten down. We lose options. But with success and power, we have more, op op more options and we have more influence. See, when we fail, we're, we're humble. Mm -hmm. But when we have success, we're not. It's harder to handle. It's interesting to watch a person when they're given power to see how they respond. Moses was pleasing to God. Although he had his incredible power, there was a gentleness about him. He didn't feel that he had to put people in their place. He didn't feel that he had to fix everybody and everything. Uh, Jesus tells us in Matthew 11, 28, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls. The King James says, for I am meek and lowly in heart. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The Lord asks us to walk alongside him, literally to yoke up with him, and he'll teach us gentleness, and he will teach us this meekness of what we've talked about this morning. Um, for us city folk, we all may not know what a yoke is. It's not the part of the A. There you go. Yeah. It's around the, yeah. It's around the chest of the, of the ox. To yes. Yeah. Yeah. So with draft horses, um, say a big draft horse can pull on its own could haul um, 8,000 pounds. So if you put two together and you yoke them up together, you would, you know, guess that they could pull 16,000 pounds because, you know, they can each pull 8,000. They should be able to double what they can pull, right? We would think that. Not true. What's not true about it? There's too much weight. You think it's too much weight? I think they can pull more. They can pull way more than that. They can pull way more. Not only double, they can, uh, it's said now that they could pull, say, 24,000 pounds. They can pull the weight of three individual horses with just two of them. See, what we can do alone, it might be impressive, it might not, but it might be. But what we can do when we join arms with another is more. And when that other that we yoke to is Jesus, then there's nothing too big. I was trying, girls, I was trying to think of a, of a analogy, a visual that you might be able to picture and and what came to my mind was, do you guys, um, on, do you still have field days? Like in school, elementary, field days? Are they still called that? Yeah. Okay, field days. Um, do you have like three-legged races? Have you guys ever done that? No. no? Three-legged race? A three-legged race. Oh my heavens. Okay, well we're gonna have to, uh, obviously, COVID go away, we have to have a three-legged race. Okay, well I'll tell you, look up here. I'm going to do it with like one leg. Okay, it's not going to be nearly as awesome as it would be with somebody else. 
Okay, you take your one leg and you take somebody else's leg mm -hmm. and um, you tie them together. Okay? Mm -hmm. You'd say your my right leg and say your left leg and we would tie them together. And then you have a race and you have to figure out how to work together yep. to the finish line yep. of the stepping at the same time with this leg, both of you, and then you have your individual legs, and then this leg right. to get to the finish line. You have to learn, learn how to work as a team. Mm -hmm. If you don't, your partner's on the ground and you lose. Mm -hmm. I, I've experienced every kind of three-legged race outcome. Hop? Oh, Hoppy just picked him up and hopped. Well, that might work if you can carry the person. <laughs> Not quite what I'm going for here on the visual there, son. Um, but with the horses, they're, they're tied together. And if they don't work as a team, that yoke can break. So they have to work together. And when they do, they can accomplish so much more. Okay. Where am I? Okay, an example of gentleness. There is the most beautiful visual of gentleness. And that is from Jesus. In Matthew 21, 21, 5. Say to the daughter Zion, see your king comes to you gentle. And that is the Greek word, um, uh, Praus, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. See, Jesus wasn't trying to impress anyone when he came into Jerusalem. There was a gentleness about him. There was a meekness, a humility, a spirit about Jesus that said, my father's in control. I, I don't have to look out for number one. I don't have to um, grab for leverage and power because God's in control. So there, I think there are two steps or two ingredients to becoming um, a biblically meek or gentle person. Now, the first thing is that this is something that only God's grace can do. And it's not human for us to be meek or gentle or humble. It's not human to want to do that. The evil, sinful nature that dwells within us um, since the beginning is a grabby, greedy, climb the ladder, knock the person off the rung if you, come, if you can kind of a mindset. So only the grace of God can help us to have this wonderful fruit of the Spirit in our life. And the second thing is, it is a conscious decision. It's a conscious decision when the person who has the power or the position or the privilege chooses to submit to the Lordship of Jesus Christ and allows them to be God controlled. So think back to the war horse controlled by its rider. We are to be controlled by God. See, gentleness is power under God's control. In Philippians 4, 5, it says, Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. See, I'm not sure we can be gentle without the Lord. It's not in our nature to be gentle and humble and meek. So when we are gentle, it says in Philippians 4, 5, the Lord is near. There's five elements of gentle people, and I'm going to use the um, letters of power to describe these five elements of gentle or meek people. Interesting that I chose that, right? Power is going to describe gentle or meek people. Okay, the first one is the letter P. And that's personality under God's control. Hello? There you are. 
personality under God's control. So a gentle person takes the personality that God's given them, unique as it is, and it places it under God's control. I think your battery's full. Jesus's three closest friends, Peter, James, and John. Uh, this is a great illustration of how God doesn't give up on us when we're not gentle or we're not meek or we're not the person that we need to be. It's a beautiful illustration of how God just keeps on loving us. So there was this time that the Lord sent James and John ahead to Samaria and um, this was a time when Jesus was extremely unpopular. They weren't well received. Um, and really the bottom line is that they, they couldn't stay at the Samaritan hotel that night. They, just, they were not welcome. And the disciples, well, honestly, they were really ticked about it. And they said, Lord, this is in Luke 9, Lord, do you want us to call fire down from heaven to destroy them? not a gentle person. No, no, no. Did you know that James and John were known as the sons of thunder? <laughs> <laughs> and then, maybe we know where we get that, where they get it, because uh, James and John's mama went to Jesus and she said, Lord, when you come into your kingdom, Please let my sweet James sit on one side and my precious John sit on the other. That's, that's not a gentle request. It's somebody looking out for the number one. But God transformed them. At the end of their lives, these men these sons of thunder were transformed. James was the first to be martyred. And John, live forever, became known as the disciple of love. That's a long way from Lord, do you want us to call fire down from heaven and destroy them? To be known as the disciple of love. Of love. God, God made James and John into different people. And he can do the same for us. Uh, and think about Peter. Uh, there are so many illustrations of Peter not being gentle, but of being impulsive and arrogant. And honestly, what blesses my heart is that despite their personalities, Jesus never gave up on them. He kept working on them and maturing them. He kept discipling them. Today, you may not be the gentle person. You may not be meek. Or maybe you're not as gentle as you want to be. But the good news is that through God's grace and maturity and seasoning, you can become that person. Okay, O, oh, outlook. You have outlook under God's control. Philippians 2, 4. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. This was a really good sermon for me to work on this week. It was. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. See, the result is when we start working for the benefit of others and not for ourselves. But that's the result, is we start working for the benefit of others and not for us. You know, gentle people are understanding. Second P, 
Peter 1, For this very reason, we make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness knowledge, and to knowledge self-control, and to self-control perseverance, and to perseverance godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. This makes the next step possible, which is for you to enjoy other people, to like them, and to finally grow to love them deeply. These are wonderful verses for people to process a better relationship with others. The first thing we have to do is, first thing I have to do is put aside Joy Lujan's desires. That, that's the first step, is I have to say, I, I'm not going to try to get what I want. What do you want? But that's the first thing, is I have to say, I need to put my desires aside. And that makes this next step possible, which is that gentle people are not demanding. James 3, 6 says, For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. W. Words under God's control. You know it isn't things that go in one ear and not the other that cause damage. It's the things that go in one ear, they get all mixed up, and then they come out our mouth. That's what causes the problems. So we need our words to be under God's control. Ephesians 4.29 says, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And James is very clear. The tongue is also, the tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole person, sets the whole course of his life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell, but no man can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. That's how our tongue is described. We cannot tame our tongue with our own strength. It can only be tamed when it's under God's control. E, expectations. To have our expectations under God's control. When we are gentle people, we not only place our personality, our outlook, our words under God's control, but our expectations. Ephesians 4.2, be completely humble and gentle, be patient, bearing with one another in love. So here's a question for us. When someone disappoints us, and we've all been disappointed by people, when someone disappoints us, are we gentle or are we judgmental? That's a good question for me to think about. Because when I'm disappointed, I usually am judgmental. Why they disappointed me. Instead of being gentle, and making sure my personality, my outlook, and my words are all under God's control. I need to do that before I open my mouth. So that I am gentle and not judgmental. See, the message to us in this is we don't have all of the fruit of the Spirit lined up. We're not perfect. But in the areas where we fall short... Let God's goodness and grace cover and forgive you. To, to pick, your, pick yourself up. You're a child of God. You can, and we can say, I'm not the person I used to be because of the grace of Lord Jesus. Like, I'm not who I was. Now, I'm not who I want to be, but I'm not who I was. And on this journey of being discipled by Jesus, I'm changing I'm being transformed. 
And then the R is response. Response under God's control. Gentle people are an R. Gentle people are proactive, not reactive. Let's listen to a couple proverbs. They're wonderful for so many things. Better, Proverbs 16, 32. Better a patient man than a warrior, a man who controls his temper than one who takes a city. Proverbs 15, 4. The tongue that brings healing is a tree of life, but a deceitful tongue crushes the spirit. There's a reason that verbal abuse is considered is abuse. There, there is a reason. A tongue can crush the spirit. I had a friend tell me, oh, I, I much rather would have taken a physical fist or a slap from my parents than to have the tongue unleashed on me. Those were words they could never forget. Their worthlessness. It, it stayed with them forever. A, a deceitful tongue crushes the spirit. And, and no abuse is good. She's not saying that one would have been better. It was her experience of, both, of experiencing both, of which she felt her damage was more lasting from the verbal abuse. A proactive person is self-controlled. A reactive person is other-controlled. I hope I'm not the only one who's ever said, you make me so mad. You upset me so much. I hope I'm not the only one. A gentle person is not controlled by the response of others. They're God-controlled. So to be a proactive person, we have to first seek to understand, then to be understood. That's Proverbs 15, 2. The tongue of the wise commends knowledge, but the mouth of the fool gushes folly. So many times we do it reversed. We want to be understood before we seek to understand. Listen to me. No, 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 no. Listen to me. Listen to me. Hear my words. And we cut people off. No, no, no. Listen. But what we're supposed to do, what we need to do, is to say, I'm listening. Hmm. We don't we all agree. I'm going to listen to you. Tell me why you think that. And to listen, not forming an argument of response while they're talking. To listen. We want to be understood first when we, the opposite needs to happen. We need to understand them before we seek to be understood. And so we have these five things. These, to be a gentle or meek person, using the word power, is we have our personality under God's control, our outlook, our words, our expectations, and our response. These are under God's control. And even if they're not where we want them to be, we can improve on it. We can close our, our mouth and listen. To not react immediately. May we walk with God so much that when people walk with us, they feel that they've been in the Lord's presence. Galatians 5.25 says, Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. So we can only 
We can only do these things. We can only be a gentle or a meek person when we submit to be under God's control. And that's whose authority we need to be under, is God's. So as we go from here this week, let's think about being meek as a war horse under God's control. So meek that we can go from a full gallop ahead to an immediate stop with one nudge of the Holy Spirit. That, that our, our reins are so controlled by God that one little pinch, that's what I call it, I get like a, a pinch, a nudge, stops me in my tracks. That's being under God's control. And when we are, then we are gentle, then we are meek, then we are humble. It's then that people are going to feel the Lord's presence with us. That just being with us will make a difference. Do you have those people in your life where you can just be with somebody and feel better? That balm? Where words don't necessarily have to be said but they are gentle. The people who are that way for me, they're old. <laughs> they're old. And they've walked with the Lord a long time. It's not something that just, I'm going to be gentle today. <laughs> because somebody's going to do something and we'll realize, oh, our personality and our expectation, our response and our words, whoop, there they go. We're not gentle anymore. It's a process. And people who've walked with the Lord a long time, they, they have this maturity of a believer. They have the faithfulness. They have the gentleness. And next week, we're going to see how they have the being self-controlled. Roy's going to bring us the message next week on self-control. Let us pray. Jesus, I thank you that it is through you that we have the power and ability to be gentle and meek. And we pray for that this morning. Lord, may we close our mouths, may we strive to be more like you. God, may we seek to be, may we seek to understand rather than being understood. In your precious and holy name, amen. Please rise. Thank you.
gentle children said, Amen. Amen. Amen.